Welcome to the Best of Sports Center 1997, a show for you, the ESPN fan. Throughout the past year, you have let us bring the world of sports into your home. The images of victory and accomplishment that make you jump out of your seat. And the sights and sounds of titles that never were. The legends who left us. And the young ones on the way. The stories that have given us new heroes. The stories that snatch them away. The good, the bad, and the ugly. The plays that made your eyes widen, your mouth drop, and make you believe what was thought unbelievable. The images that made you cheer, the images that gave you chills, and the images that made you proud. All those moments that you can watch over and over and over again. For the young and the young at heart who have given so much time to us, we thank you with a look back at the best of Sports Center, 1997. Best of Sports Center is presented by Coors Light. Holiday greetings. Welcome to the Cliff Notes version of ESPN's take on the year in sports for 1997. Alongside Kenny Main, I'm Dan Patrick. It was a year the Heisman went to a guy in the other huddle, and several huddles were overseen for the last time by extraordinary men. Some other men will be noted for their infamy. So here we go. 1997 is almost in the can. And we begin with baseball's first attempt at cross-pollination, Kenny. The line separating the National League from the American League is no longer indelible. It was blurred six months ago with the advent of interleague play. Baseball's great experiment showcased 214 games over an 18-day span. And judging from the turnout at the box office, interleague play is here to stay. The average attendance for these games was just over 33,000, which was nearly 20% more than the rest of the regular season. The first interleague game was played on June 12th between the Texas Rangers and San Francisco Giants. And your first interleague home run, Stan Javier off Darren Oliver. Giants won this game 4-3. Mets and the Yankees, June 18th. Bottom of the 10th, tied at 2, Tino Martinez. The base hit brings in Paul O'Neill. Yankees win it 3-2 and take the series two games to one. Angels at the Dodgers, first regular season meeting. Bottom of the ninth, tied at 3, but no longer. Todd Zeal off Troy Percival with two outs. The Dodgers win it 4-3. First game in Anaheim, Chan Ho Park rushes Tony Phillips back. So much for interleague camaraderie. Bench is clear. Dodgers won the game, swept the four-game series against the Angels. Nobody was better in interleague play than the artist formerly known as the Expos. Montreal won 12 of its 15 games in the individual portion of the program. Eric Karros hit 10 of his 31 homers in interleague play. The worst interleague record? owned by the Angels, who went 4-12. and 12. Overall, the National League held an edge over the American League, claiming 117 of the 214 games played. Back in 1927, Babe Ruth set the single-season home run mark when he hit 60. That record stood for 34 years, until Roger Maris hit 61 in 1961. In 1997, Maris's record survived its 36th season, but not without its most serious challenge ever eluding the pursuits of Mark McGuire and Ken Griffey Jr. Waiting to see if Maris is going to hit number 61. Here's the windup. Fastball hit deep to right. Looking it. Way back there. Oh, Griffey! Fly ball to left field and deep. Going back, Reed. Number one all time in April, Ken Griffey Jr. My, oh my! Off the scoreboard. Wow, look at all. He has teed off on Randy Johnson and destroyed the baseball. 
Well hit and there it goes. Junior has just broken his own Major League record for the most home runs hit by the end of May. Holy smoke, his MVP season continues to get better. I think Mac just put the longest shot in this stadium on the board. Way upstairs. How far is this one going? <laughs> Upper deck, way off the line. <laughs> Where's this one going? Off the scoreboard! Wow. Belt it deep to left center field. Junior at 45 to a very exclusive club. Number 51. 52nd of the season. 53. Number 54. You've got your double nickels. 55. 56. 57. Number 58. McGuire won the statistical battle in both volume and length as five of his 58 went at least 500 feet. Junior did hit more homers off left-handers than McGuire did, 14 to 12. 37 of McGuire's homers were of the solo variety, while 23 of Junior's came with two strikes. Eight pitchers served up home runs to both players this past season, but only the Padres' Joey Hamilton can say he allowed two homers to each. The interleague play of greatest consequence was between the Marlins and Indians, of course. Edgar Renteria had the Game 7 winning hit for Florida. It made him man of the moment and later man of the year in his native Columbia. In an opinion poll, he nearly doubled the vote for two top presidential candidates. Now, it's said money can't buy happiness, but it's sometimes a good substitute. And the money spent by the Marlins to compete was well spent. Here's Peter Gammons. With the 69 Mets, the word was miracle. With the 97 Marlins, the word is money. The rules of the road to a title are different now. A new team can compete for a title in a hurry if it can spend freely and wisely in the free agent market. The Marlins are the role models for the next generation of expansionites in Tampa Bay and Arizona. First, because they built baseball's richest and deepest farm system. But the talent foundation was not enough to capture South Florida's eye. And after signing Kevin Brown, Al Leiter, and Devon White before the 96 season, Wayne Huizenga opened his vault for Moises Alou, Alex Fernandez, Bobby Bonilla, Cleveland. Our attendance dwindled uh, to an alarming rate, and it was all of our decisions collectively, and, and along with Mr. Heisinger's resources, that we felt that we needed to go out and put ourselves in a position to win as many games as possible and see if our fans would come back brought life to this franchise. We've rejuvenated interest in South Florida. You can just feel the enthusiasm. It's all over the community. It was not like this a couple years ago or last season. If you're a fan in Kansas City or Houston, Oakland or Boston, you probably know that the Indians and Marlins were among the five highest paid teams in baseball. And to get here, Cleveland has had to sell out every game since June of $19. And you're probably asking, is there a minimum payroll just to get to the World Series? If you have a lower payroll and you end up winning at all, you're very fortunate in today's game. The task of repeating or sustaining a playoff type club for a two or three year per uh, period is going to be next to impossible. I think there's a minimum payroll level to be good year after year. I think you can be fortunate and still have everything fall into place for you if you get to the playoffs in a particular year with a lower payroll. But still, it's tough to beat those the clubs with high payrolls because of the depth they have in their organization. Obviously, it takes more than money. The Indians rival the Marlins for the best farm system, while the $75 million the White Sox spent on Albert Bell and Jamie Navarro turned out to be a PR and performance nightmare. The ability for clubs to spend money enhances their ability to get here, but there's a lot that are sitting home that, uh, that didn't make it that spent a lot of money. I think the landscape is littered with train wrecks of clubs that have spent money that have not made it. 
That said, players want to go to teams that spend, both for their bank accounts and the pursuit of a ring. The, the team, the organization between Dave and Don and, and Jim and, and Wayne uh, writing the checkbook saying, go out and get the right players to put this team together. And they did an awesome job. Wayne Huizinga has a lot to do with that. And uh, the people in the front office, I think they wanted to get a winner in here and they went out and spent some bucks. Tell Wayne, if we need to, if we need to, this is the only way we can win another world champion. I hope he's going to lose another 30 million. Tonight it's worth it. Peter Gammons on the champion Marlins. Now, after winning the series, the Marlins players paraded in convertibles and boats. It would have been more appropriate to see him at the wheel of moving vans. Ten of the 11 players listed here have been sent elsewhere. A cost-cutting scheme not rivaled since Graham Rudman. The exception, Darren Dalton, who retired. The money saved on him and all the others, all the better for selling the team, a team that won't be favored to repeat. For a time, it appeared Tiger Woods would win just about every golf tournament he entered. He proved to be human. He also inspired many humans to pick up the game of golf. His story coming when we continue. As much as we'd all like to forget it, Mike Tyson's act of lunacy can't be overlooked when it comes to the big impact stories of 97. Then there were the more uplifting moments. Brett Favre battled back from addiction to win another MVP and the Super Bowl. Michael Jordan, long ago he exhausted our adjective list, but he wasn't done winning titles. And as the year came to a close, so did Latrell Sprewell's season. Please stay. Best of Sports Center, presented by Coors Light. Frost brewed to tap the clean taste of the Rockies. Way back when, for the first time, the Green Bay Packers didn't win a Super Bowl. These guys carried a sign across the field after the Jets beat the Colts, and it read, The Pack Will Be Back. They had to wait a while. Long after Starr and Lombardi, Adderley and Kramer, a new generation of Packers not only got Green Bay back in the Super Bowl, they won it. Super Bowl 31, the Packers and the Patriots. First quarter, no score until that. Brett Favre cranks it out. Andre Risen, 54-yard play, 7-0 Packers. Favre was 14-27, 246 yards, two touchdown passes. Third quarter, New England has closed it to a six-point game, but Desmond Howard has the ball at the one and then more. He returned four punts for touchdowns during the regular season in the playoff. This one a kickoff. This one broke the back of the Patriots. Howard, the first special teams player to receive the Super Bowl MVP. The Packers winners 35-21. Mike Holmgren carried off in what looks like a slick TV ad and Reggie White, his first Super Bowl title. He said the situation had become intolerable, past the boiling point, the culmination of weeks of anger and frustration. So Latrell Sprewell decided to take matters into his own hands. Those matters just happened to be the neck of his head coach, P.J. Carlissimo. Sprewell's attack brought about a one-year suspension from the league office, the voiding of his $32 million contract with the Warriors, along with a mixture of sympathy and disdain. There were words exchanged back and forth and uh, asked uh, Spree to leave practice, and uh, he didn't, and the words kind of escalated to uh, some physical contact, and then uh, later on in practice, 15 or 20 minutes later, um, Spree returned, and there was some more uh, physical contact. The 1 in 13 Warriors have suspended Latrell Spreewell, their leading scorer, for 10 games without pay. Spree, what are you doing? You lost your mind. It's free. I hate to see these uh, kind of incidents, whether uh, it's free rules right or wrong or it's PJ or whatever happened, but uh, I don't think it's good for, for NBA basketball. First of all, I want to apologize to my fans and my family and friends of mine who, uh, who uh, saw this, and, and it's definitely not something that I condone, but uh, it did happen. It's a mistake I made. You feel like you want to apologize to PJ? <laughs> see? I don't want you to ask me that. The Warriors organization has decided that it will not trade Latrell Sprewell. We are terminating his contract, or we did terminate his contract early this evening. Punishment swift and severe from the NBA, which today suspended Sprewell for a year without pay. We definitely um, disagree with it. We're going to fight it. We, we don't feel that either the Warriors or the NBA have the right to, uh, to uh, suspend him. I want to start by apologizing publicly to P.J. Carlissimo and to Gary St. Jean. I know that this conduct 
is not appropriate in society or in professional sports. And I totally accept the responsibility for what I've done. The pun was unintentional, but in the aftermath of the Spreewell suspension, the Warriors placed a gag order on all employees, including the team's announcers. Spreewell filed a grievance against both the Warriors and the league office. The hearing on that grievance will not be heard until January 27th. Still to come on the best of Sports Center, the Rainbow Warrior finds another pot of gold at the end of his NASCAR season. The amazing Jeff Gordon. While in Chicago, Michael tells the rest of the league, repeat after me. For over 16 years, Marchese Computer Products has been giving you the state-of-the-art in computers, printers, and laptops, not to mention the training you'll get with your purchase. Marchese Computer Products also has the newest in software, accessories, and books. And there's always factory-authorized service available. Stop by Marchese Computer Products today for great selections at great prices. We sell you what you need, not just a box. Just having dinner. Oh man, is everybody shooting this scene? Looking for something original? USA Network, the cure for the common show. With ESPN Magazine coming out, I really hope they take every precaution to avoid the coveting situation. Something that's plagued me my entire career. Tiger Beat in '93. I sprained my ankle. Model Railroad of 96, I went into a five-game slump. Cat Fancy almost ended my career. I know one thing. I'm never doing Cat Fancy again. Once again, we were fortunate to work with some talented writers, directors, key grips, and guys who say break for lunch. Those are the people behind our This Is Sports Center promotions. Via ESPN.com, you voted for your favorites. If the top pick cannot fulfill its duties, the runner-up will cut ribbons at malls. Those two later, right now, the third-place finisher. People ask me all the time, how do you decide which anchors work together? And to be honest, it's an awkward process. Dear Larry, want to do the sports together? If yes, check this box. Charlie? Ultimately, you're looking for a good relationship. Um, if you're not doing anything later tonight, uh... Would you want to do a show with me? Whoever said all's fair in love and war was probably a broadcaster. We'll be back with more Sports Center in just a moment. I don't even know who you are anymore. Jeff Gordon had a part in a separate promotion, the ESPN NASCAR Ride Along program. Are you Rita Moreno? Went the question to Jeff as he played 20 questions with a backseat driver. It was one of the few distractions on the track for Gordon, but it wasn't as easy as he made it look. Gordon won his second Winston Cup title. He joined Bill Elliott as an exclusive twosome who've won the Winston Million bonus, and to do so, he won the Southern 500 for a record third straight time. All this while dealing with the cancer afflicting his close friend and car owner Rick Hendrick. Here's how the 24 ran to be number one. Here comes Jeff Gordon to take the lead. Jeff Gordon has won the Bud at the Glen. Yeah, we did it! But Jeff Gordon wins it! Jeff Gordon wins the 1997 NASCAR Winston Cup Championship. Since the beginning of the 1995 season, Gordon is far and away the race wins leader in Winston Cup. His 27 victories gave him a better than 28% winning percentage. The next best on the list is Dale Jarrett with 12 wins, which is just under 13%. Gordon's the youngest driver to have won two cup titles. They were built to last, carefully assembled by a shrewd general manager, expertly handled by a brilliant coach, and of course led by the greatest player ever. The result? Five titles in seven years. In this day and age of free agent hopscotch, the Bulls have carved out a dynasty. David Aldridge searches for their place in history.
they have slipped the surly bonds of mortals and made their claim to the gods of history. A fifth title in seven seasons for the Chicago Bulls. They can now make the case that they are the ascendant team of their generation. Better than the Lakers of Magic, Kareem and Worthy, superior to the Celtics of Bird, McHale, DJ and Parrish. Well, it's certainly a dynasty. Uh, you know, I don't know how you rank dynasties, but any team that can win five times in seven years. And the, the, I think that the two years before we won our first title, we lost to the team that won the title. So, you know, we've had a decade that's been a heck of a run. I think for a single season, we got to give a nod to the Bulls. You know, anytime you win 72 games, you got to give a nod to them for a single season. Not only that, they went on to win the championship. Overall, best team, you got to, I think that's open for debate. As dynasties go, the Bulls are in relative infancy. Short of the Yankees' colossus, the Canadians' 30-year reign in Boston's 11 NBA titles in 13 seasons. Jerry Krause, the Bulls' secretive yet successful general manager, has his own model in the Baltimore Orioles, who made six World Series in a 17-year span and were baseball's winningest team for two decades. They did a tremendous job over a 25-year span. And, and, and one of the things that we tried to do and, and we'll try to do in the future is keep this organization at a high level for a long period of time. That's the task that I have in front of me. In an era where free agency has wrecked the title dreams of contenders and where expansion has diluted the talent pool for all teams, the Bulls have managed to remain constant. Krause has taken the heat for Reinsdorf since 1985. Phil Jackson came aboard in 1987. And Jordan and Pippen have missed just 26 games combined over their last nine full seasons. No matter how many points Michael scored, it was a team effort. And we're, we're hoping and praying that we can continue that, that destiny, that there's no one that's going to knock us off right now. And like other corporate behemoths, IBM, Microsoft, Disney, the Bulls have developed an arrogance that will only be quelled with their defeat. But like UCLA's Bruins or the Packers, there is on these Bulls the one transcendent figure whose impact can be felt throughout the game. That is the legacy of Michael Jeffrey Jordan, now six years removed from that tearful night in Inglewood. His father at his side when the Bulls won their first title. It is now a fair question. If Jordan hadn't taken his baseball interlude, would we be looking at a seven-peat? There's no question Michael's the greatest player to play in any team sport. If you give up, then they give up, you know. So I didn't want to give up, you know. No matter how sick I was, or how tired I was, or how, you know, low on energy I was, I felt the obligation, you know, to my team, to the city of Chicago to go out and give that extra effort so that we could be here for the fifth championship. For a century, Chicago has been known as the second city and suffered from a major inferiority complex. Now, like Coca-Cola and Xerox, Chicago is synonymous with brand name excellence. The Bulls will not be defined by any one season. They have moved beyond the limits of their time. In Chicago, I'm David Aldridge, ESPN. The Bulls' management was able to keep the core of the team intact for this season, signing Michael Jordan, Dennis Rodman, and Phil Jackson to one-year deals. Scottie Pippen, who was already under contract, has yet to play this season after undergoing uh, foot surgery. Last month, he said he would never play for the Bulls again and wanted to be traded. He claims management has disrespected him by dangling him as trade bait. Pippen is expected to be healthy enough to return to action next month. Patrick Ewing is expected to return next season. The New York Center suffered a broken wrist this past weekend while attempting this dunk against the Bucks in Milwaukee. The 35-year-old Ewing will have his right wrist in a cast for two months before he can begin rehabilitation. So to come on the best of Sports Center, the best quotes heard on Sports Center, including Steve Kerr's claim of being the Bulls' new go-to guy. And Phil told Michael, he said, Michael, I want you to take the last shot. And Michael said, you know, Phil, I don't feel real comfortable in these situations. So, maybe we ought to go in another direction. In Proverbs, it says, even a fool when silent is considered wise. No doubt you've noticed we don't always adhere to that. And it's safe to argue neither do the athletes and coaches. Our sampling of responses ran the gamut in 1997 from serious to downright silly. Here's the best of this year's Sound and Fury. Hey, uh, I gotta go talk to the world here, buddy. There's three quarterbacks on this football team. Whichever one starts, starts. Whichever ones don't, we'll back him up. Period. Cut and dry. It's nobody's concern but ours. Nobody's. Next. Injuries from the uh, game. Talk to the trainer. Next. You doing all right now? Mike, why are you in such a bad mood? 
What do you care? Right. Okay. If you were two and seven, you'd be in a bad mood, too. Not very much fun, is it? Well, I think, obviously, any time you have, you know, there's some friction and, you, and some uh, extra, what's that word I'm thinking of? You know, to testosterone, to testosterone, <laughs> whatever. There's a lot of t testosterone in the air tonight. It was unfortunate what happened, but sure, I wouldn't go back and change nothing, man. The atmosphere last night was unbelievable. It wasn't nothing about the loot, and now it's money, okay? <laughs> I'm not trying to be cute here, okay? I'm just going to say it. They want you to cook the dinner, at least they ought to let you shop for some of the groceries. I think our groceries are pretty good. I have, no, they're fresh. All I know about grocery shopping is when I go with my wife, she makes me push the cart. Never overload your ass with your mouth, okay? And I, I, I've learned that, I, I have overloaded. I just kicked the camera and he decided he didn't want to film anymore and he thought they had his back and neck and legs and 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 things like that was bothering him. So, but uh, I'm pretty sure I'm going to get some papers next time I come. <laughs> I cannot tell why exactly I acted like I did other than um, to say when the button occurred uh, and I thought I might lose because of a severity of a cut above my eye, I just, I just snapped. I just hope that everyone out there can forgive me for the mistake that I made and hopefully... Nothing like this will ever happen again. If you have a disagreement with somebody, you don't have to apologize to them. I'm not going to apologize to that <laughs> through, through the one in, in, down in Orlando. <laughs> he's doing quite well. Pretty impressive. The uh, little boy's uh, driving it well. He's putting well. He's, he's doing everything it takes to win. So you know what you guys do when he gets in here? Pat him on the back, say congratulations, enjoy it, and tell him not to serve fried chicken next year. Got it. Right. <laughs> or collard greens or whatever the hell it's called. In light of the substance and the uh, source of the uh, allegations that have surfaced uh, in the last 48 hours, I would like to reassert my innocence and reiterate that all the charges against me are false and will be proven false in a court of law. As for the future, I, I'm just looking to uh, put the pieces of my life uh, back together and eventually uh, restore my broadcasting career. They have a playoff team right here, and it's not too late to make the playoffs. But these phonies who have been producing at that level in the room, that is over with. We have to go two days, twice a day like I've done before. We have to go three a day. We're going to go three a day. And as far as I'm concerned, golf is over until we start winning hockey games here. Hey, are y'all rerunning it? Are you rewriting it and reprinting it like I asked you to? With the same intensity that you did. The same intensity. Don't lose the intensity. Don't lose the intensity. The head coach, who is a class guy, he said, you know, he didn't even know where Charlotte, North Carolina was. I want to uh, uh, propose a question to Barry Swister. While you're sitting at home next week, do you know where Charlotte, North Carolina is now, baby? And now at this time, I'm officially announcing my retirement from the NFL and as a quarterback of the Buffalo Bills. They come so far and, uh, you know, you want them to win so they can feel the excitement of the Final Four. You know, I've been there as an assistant. It's great to win a national championship, but you just want your team that's been through so much adversity, you know, with the loss of their head coach just to share that and experience that. And I knew they weren't going to get that opportunity. You, you're going to make the best of it. I'm going to do whatever I can to, to stay alive and enjoy my life. And I, I've said it uh, before and I'll say it again. I, I don't mind dying. I just want to live until I die. Well, I want to thank you all coming, uh, for coming again today. Uh, sorry about being a little vague again. Just like, just like last time when I first got diagnosed. But... Uh, It's okay, man. It's okay. Um, the bottom line is, um, I went through uh, six chemotherapy treatments. Sorry for uh, losing it. And I wish I was here saying I'm going to sign a five-year deal for thirty million, but <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think those those days are well well gone. In honor of Jackie, Major League Baseball is taking the unprecedented step 
of retiring his uniform number, number 42, in perpetuity. And that's how 1997 sounded. And on we go. It's uncertain whether Mike Tyson will ever fight again. We'll explore that a bit later on this Best of Sports Center. And we'll honor the Dean. The great run at North Carolina came to an end. The year's wildest play took place in the Pennsylvania High School District 1 playoffs between Lansdale Catholic and Upper Perky Omen. There it is. Look at it. They still got it going. They still got it going. Gives it off again. Somebody's got to get behind him. Nobody's behind him. There it is. That's Herman. Why not? Why not? He might go. He's going to go. He might go. One man to beat go. He might go. He is. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. That's just one play. This one's about consistency. We'll get to his unparalleled coaching record shortly, but this alone would be notable. A figure a guy could go to retirement with and know he made an impact on the lives of young men. Dean Smith retired as basketball coach of North Carolina Tar Heels with a player graduation percentage of better than 97. He also won a lot of games, more than any other in Division I. Curry Kirkpatrick is the reporter on this. The man didn't actually invent the game. It only seems he did. The man wasn't born to coach. He's only a descendant of that special breed. Nurtured amid the same Kansas Plains as the fellow he just passed in college basketball's rich history, Dean Smith played at Kansas 30 years after Adolph Rupp. Both were coached there by Fogg Allen, who was coached by James Naismith, who did invent basketball. That's called roots. He's simply the greatest team coach I think there ever was. So he definitely, you know, I think paved the way to, of college basketball. He's done so much for the, for the game. Uh, you know, I think he's probably made it to the game it is today. Smith's most significant mentor, Frank McGuire, who brought him to North Carolina, once joked of his assistant, nobody gets named Dean, he becomes a Dean. Sure enough, now Smith is both. His legacy, strong ethics, a clean program, scores of ACC, NCAA, and Olympic champions. And oh yes, the one and only player of the age, as well as for all time. If he wrote a book on it just himself, I mean, I think, uh, <laughs> I think personally the world would be in a better situation. And if uh, I was fortunate enough just to help this game one-tenth of what he's done for it, I'd, I'd be thrilled. For him to be able to stay at one institution, uh, free of violations, uh, have the kind of record that he's had, the percentage of games that they've won, the championships that they've won uh, over all of those years, and the total number of games that they've won, I think, is a great, great accomplishment. With all that winning, a man probably deserves a restaurant named after one of his own innovations. Not to mention a massive domed arena built to honor his own name. But all of this almost never happened. It was at this site 32 years ago that one of Dean Smith's earliest Tar Heel teams returned to Chapel Hill by bus. It was another crushing defeat, their fourth in a row. What they found was a dummy hanging from this tree. The dummy was an effigy of Dean Smith. We come back from Wake Forest and I see a dummy hanging out there It looks like me. I was one of the players that pulled this down because we were very upset and realized that Coach Smith wasn't the reason we were losing. It was us, the players. I was never in danger of losing the job, but it made me think, gosh, who needs this? Maybe I shouldn't be in coaching. But Smith changed his mind to the singular benefit of all Tar Heels' social consciousness. As an assistant coach, he helped open up Chapel Hill to desegregation. Later, he recruited and coached one of the South's first high-profile black players, Charlie Scott. Coach Smith's philosophy was that he didn't want you to think of yourself as any different. He didn't want anybody to think that he thought of anybody else as any different. I think he just does things like that because he thinks it's right, and, and that's what he believes in. And, and he's really strong-minded uh, when it comes to the things that he believes in. He didn't treat me any better or any worse. He treated me just like he treated everybody else. Smith's belief in team over individual play is as firm as the coaches minimizing his own role in the panoply of Carolina Hoops history. In truth, the coach never sought his immortal 877. He nearly quit the quest long before it took on a certain life of its own. He said, there's no way 
nothing will make me do that. Uh, if if we're up one hundred, if we're up one eight hundred, I'll stop at seven hundred and ninety-nine. He felt like that that would be a disservice to Coach Rell. Uh, then again, that's Coach way, Coach's way of looking at things. If it hadn't been for Roy Williams and Eddie Fogler and some of those people talking with him, he would have quit. There's been a concerted effort by individuals to say, hey, if, if you don't want to coach, don't coach. But certainly don't, you know, not coach because you're shy about, you know, establishing uh, a win record of this magnitude. That would have been a bad reason to quit coaching. It would be a bad reason to continue coaching. It shouldn't even enter into the picture and someone uh, several people made that very clear Smith can deflect all the attention he wishes his enduring legacy remains an astounding galaxy of names who have created their own lasting celebrity the transcendent Jordan Cunningham worthy all honored among the NBA's all-time top 50 players coaches Brown Carl Fogler and Williams he so enjoys coaching that I think it spurs a lot of other guys to go go into it. He's like the Mr. Chips of coaches. There's a lot of us that wouldn't be here in this profession if it wasn't for him. He's still in contact with each individual. He still has a hand in what we do in life. He's still he's still a father, a father figure to all of us. He was the second father to me, uh, as well as he's the second father to a lot, a lot of Carolina players. I decided to call him the godfather because that's kind of how, how he is. I mean, everybody... You know, all his former players call back to him. There's not a single North Carolina player or assistant coach that worked for him that makes a major decision in their life without checking with Coach Smith, and that's a heck of a burden to have, but uh, he's handled it pretty well. The fraternity that we have at Carolina is, there's no fraternity like it in the world. We believe in Coach Smith. We believe in the program. We will do anything for him. That's what makes Carolina special. That's what makes all of us feel a part of a family. That's what makes it possible for a guy like me who played in 1966 to be associated with a player that's playing today as Coach Smith. That's that one single bond that keeps us all together. And that to me is family, that's tradition. That's the great thing about Carolina. And the rundown, 879 wins a record, 65 tournament wins a record, 30 20 win seasons a record, 24 top 10 finishes also a record. He coached an Olympic gold medal team, 12 ACC titles, 26 All-America AA titles. Good run. Coming later on the show, the images of 1997. Iverson working over Jordan was one, certainly. And picture this. Eddie Robinson no longer on the Grambling sideline. Your tennis king and queen from 1997, Pete Sampras, number one at year's end for the fifth straight time. That ties Jimmy Connor's record. Sampras won the Australian and Wimbledon. Seven tournament wins total, six and a half million in prize money. Martina Hingis ruled the women's game. She beat Mary Pearson, Australia, went on to win two other majors. There she is in Wimbledon taking down Yana Novotna. Hingis won 3.4 million in 97 and 12 tournaments total. Back in 1995, Tiger Woods walked off the 18th green during the final round of the Masters, having completed his four rounds at five over par. He was asked by reporters what was next. Woods quickly responded, I've got a 9 a.m. history class tomorrow. Two years later, Woods walked off the 18th green at Augusta, having made history. Jimmy Roberts was on hand to chronicle the event and its significance. It wasn't only about race. It wasn't only about youth. It wasn't only about power. The human tidal wave that crashed around Woods this week came in all colors, in all ages, sizes, and strengths. A middle-aged white man said that Woods fascinated because the young man could hit seven iron longer than the older man could hit driver. It was why he wanted to see. For other reasons, some needed to see. As Woods came to the first tee, the men and boys who work in this storied clubhouse came to watch and to feel proud. One said he never thought he would live to see the day, not in this place. And 50 years to the week after Jackie Robinson first broke the color barrier in baseball, there was Lee Elder. The year that Tiger Woods was born, Elder became the first black man to play in this championship. He remembers his arrival, his reception. 
it was not done very warmly. Uh, uh, I, there were some things that were said and some things that, uh, was, uh, that I was uh, unhappy about, uh, but we soon got them squared away. If you wonder why this means so much to so many, just stop and think. Calvin Pete is a black man. John Daly is a long hitter. And you can take your pick of any one of a number of young, appealing talents in just about any sport. But Tiger Woods is all of this. And one more thing. On the strength of what we have seen over the last four days, maybe, just maybe, he could become the best ever to play this game. He is the only man to win more than $2 million in a single season on the PGA Tour, but only 300000 of that total came during Tiger Woods' final eight events of the year when he failed to produce a single victory. Still to come on the Best of Sports Center, the lasting images that made up the year in sports, 1997. Countdown to the number one ESPN commercial continues. Here's number two. Being on SportsCenter does take its toll. For Kenny Main, I'm Dan Patrick. Good night. Once we finish a show, we do it all over again for the overseas markets. Three, two, one. Buenas noches, amigos. Me llamo Kenny Main. Same highlights, same anchors, different dialects. Dos Vidanya. Menu za Boot, Boris Patrick. Voot, Kenny Mansky. To touch people all over the world, that's that's special. We're coming back. The Red Wings won the Stanley Cup, but soon after dealt with departures and tragedy. Tom Osborne ends his great run in Nebraska with yet another bowl game. And versatility was rewarded in this year's Heisman selection. Charles Woodson will play his slash role for Michigan in the Rose Bowl. No one remembers the name of the second man to walk on the moon. At least I don't. Likewise, any fool can ride a snowboard, just like any fool can ride a motorcycle. But I was a star because whether I made those jumps or not, I was the first to try. These kids know to be a winner, you need the will to do what the other guys won't. Yes, sir. Up here is one bad jump for man and one super bad jump for mankind. The Winter X Games, presented by Nike. It finally happened. A defensive player won the Heisman. Michigan's Charles Woodson ripping off Michigan State one-handed there. Then he shows his versatility against Ohio State. Running back the punt all the way for the touchdown. Michigan won the Big Ten title. We'll play Washington State in the Rose Bowl. And Woodson, the first primarily defensive player to win a Heisman. Tom Osborne felt blessed that he was able to make the decision himself instead of somebody making it for him. I think it's important in this business, said Osborne, to walk away while you can still walk. His last day on the job will be January 2nd when his Cornhuskers meet Tennessee in the Orange Bowl. On December 10th, Osborne formally decided it was time to leave after a quarter of a century as Nebraska's head football coach. Essentially, uh, you know, at this time, obviously, I'm, I'm going to step aside after the bowl game. I want to make that very clear that it's got to be after January 2nd. I'm in reasonably good shape. I mean, I have no uh, major problems where I'm going to keel over right here in front of you or anything like that. I don't want to be in a position of, at some point, somebody getting me aside and telling me, uh, you know, you're not getting the job done anymore. Uh, I think it's important in this business to walk away while you can still walk and while you can still uh, still uh, function and perform. And I feel that I can at this point. It's been an emotional day for, for the players and, and for the coaches and, and really for the whole state of Nebraska. And, and sitting back there when Coach Osborne was saying that uh, he really didn't get a chance to see his, his kids grow up that much. It, I just wanted to say that, that he's had a chance to watch 150 guys on this team grow up and the thousands that came before us that he's coached grow up and, and he's been like a father figure to all of us. You know, by his uh, example and the example he sets, uh, we don't just learn football around here, we learn how to be, uh, how to be grown ups, how to mature and how to become men and uh, that's the thing that he's taught me the most and I'd like to thank you for that and uh, we're just going to do the, our best to go down to the Orange Bowl and make sure that he goes out a winner and goes out a champion. Since he still is active for one more game, we thought we would look at the winningest active coaches who have put in a minimum 100 games on the job. Osborne 
reached 250 wins faster than any coach in history. He has won more than 83% of his games. Tough shoes for his replacement, Frank Solich, to fill. Back in the days, blacks and whites weren't playing much football together, weren't doing much of anything together. Eddie Robinson began to put the first touches on something separate but equal, in the very best sense of the phrase. In 1941, he helped initiate a football program at Grambling. 1997 was his retirement year, but he'd long ago established his school as a football power and himself a model educator. Since 41, it's been Gramlin. 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 And that's what it is. I wanted to coach since the time I was in fourth grade. The first time that ball is snapped, you got to knock hell out of him and let him know one thing. That boy, you going to be in trouble this evening. You got a good man in front of you. And when I came, it's part in one. The hills will ring, the victory song. It's the pride, the winning attitude that made us grab. It's the most rewarding profession in the world. And no man is too great to coach the American youth. Take that step and bring the children. All right, let's go. Down. Hook one. Turn. Good, good. Let me tell you about my whole career. I got a piece of every teacher I had, and every football player that's been through here, I got a piece of him. I think I'm the luckiest man in the world to have the privilege to coach people like you. Oh, Ramblin, dear Ramblin, we love you dear. For 55 seasons, he was the Grambling Players' personal alarm clock, walking through the dorms, getting kids up and off to an early start. He ends his coaching with a record 408 wins, and his program is now in the hands of a disciple, former Grambling and Super Bowl MVP quarterback Doug Williams, one of the 210 Robinson players to go to the NFL, but hardly the only ones to be affected by Coach Robinson. And off that high note, we move to that awful night last June in Las Vegas. Then move away from it to ponder what's next for Mike Tyson. An amazing development at Las Vegas. Mike Tyson, we told you he didn't came out without his mouthpiece for the third round. Now we know why. He took a bite out of Evander Holyfield's right ear. I mean a bite. There is a noticeable chunk missing from Holyfield's ear. They have stopped the fight. We're not sure what the resolution is going to be. I disqualified Tyson for the second foul. I told him, do not do that again. If you do, you're gone. Mike Tyson has been disqualified. 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 The whole thing is that I mean, there's just an easy way to get out of the fight, the foul, because you know you're going to get disqualified. There were a lot of questions about Mike Tyson's psychological state. I think some of those questions were answered here tonight. What am I to do? This is my career. I can't continue getting buddy like that. Not only does Mike Tyson appear to be a desperate fighter, he appears to be a desperate human being in need of some help. Boxing is considered a barbaric sport. I mean, is there anything more barbaric than biting off uh, a piece of another man's ear? From our Truth is Stranger Than Fiction department, we revisit Tyson Holyfield, not so much to show again what's been replayed ad nauseum, but for a look forward to what's next for Mike Tyson. This is the second time Tyson's career has been interrupted. Five years ago, Tyson was convicted of rape and served three years in jail. This past July, at age 31, Tyson was suspended from his sport for a year for biting Holyfield. A pair of events that now leave us with a pair of questions. How many chances and how many years does Iron Mike have left in the sport? Here's Reese Davis. The 
uh, the teacher would give me an assignment to do the book. He would rather re uh, read the boxing books, all about boxers. He would read that. He would just put that aside. He, he said, I don't want that. I'm not going to make a living from that. I'm going to make a living from boxing. Boxing was a, was a ladder that pulled him out of the ghetto, that pulled him out of crime, that pulled him through life, that opened up a door of possibility for him. It was through boxing that Mike found his way into life and found a way that he could succeed. And if he remains dedicated, interested, and without any distractions, I believe that eventually he will go down in history as the greatest heavyweight champion we've ever had. Since he took up the sport at age 12, boxing has been Mike Tyson's meal ticket, his passion, his salvation. Now for the second time in five years, Tyson faces a prolonged absence from the ring and the emotional void left by life without boxing. I suspect that uh, he's going to have a very hard time dealing with the fact that he's no longer the prince of the boxing universe. I think life is going to be hellish for Tyson because his identity has been so tied up with being a fighter uh, and where once he was proclaimed the baddest man on the planet and given the deference that uh, that kind of reputation uh, gains you, uh, now he's a subject of ridicule. Boxing was the only thing that gave him that control. Now it, that control is taken away from him. So. So you should expect Tyson not to behave that well in, without boxing. Because the only time he is under discipline and under control, emotional control, is in training and in fighting. And they're taking that away from him. When a fighter is training all his life, and that's the only thing he does is fight, it's like, it's like taking away your kid or something, you know? It's, it's very difficult. It's going to be difficult for him. Tyson's resiliency has been tested before when he spent three years in an Indiana prison serving a rape conviction sentence. I always stand upright under any kind of adversity. That's when I met my best. He is a strong-willed young man. And no matter what type of challenge Mr. Tyson faces, I believe Mr. Tyson will be able to take those responsibilities and turn them around as he has done so many more times than you realize and can believe. Mike is an adapter. Mike is a human being, and I believe there's life after boxing for Mike, and I believe there's a greater life after boxing for Mike. But contrary to his last boxing sabbatical, Tyson must adjust outside the structured and disciplined prison environment. Tyson claims to have found peace through a new and stable personal life. That peace will be tested as he aims to occupy his idle time and resist the temptations that lie outside the ring. There's a great potential for any and all of these athletes that once they've finished their successful endeavors of athletes or unfortunately are finished because of their activities within uh, the field of play can often return back to their roots. The question is, what is he going to be able to find that's going to keep him out of trouble? This is a problem with all fighters. They're, they're usually not interested in anything but their sport and in making a lot of money. Mike trained the whole time he was in prison. He ran, he exercised, he did push-ups. Mike has a, a strong interest in reading, and he has a strong interest in history. He likes working with young people. I don't think he'll be sitting there idly twiddling his thumb, waiting for the time to go by. I think that he will be investing his time and investing it very, very wisely because he is a very intelligent and very talented young man. If Tyson wishes to fight overseas, two hurdles must be clear. First, in accordance with his probation, he must get permission to travel outside the country from Indiana trial judge Patricia Gifford. Second, there must be a location willing to accept him. I don't think that we take a chance in, in having Tyson fight there when he's suspended in the United States. I think it would be, it would be politically incorrect to do that. Place may not be as important as time, and it's running out on Tyson. At 31, the pursuit of the lofty aspirations held by Tyson and his late mentor, Customato, may be all but over. He knows that uh, in terms of boxing history, his place is, uh, the carpet's been pulled out from under him. And uh, because of that, there's going to be, uh, I think, uh, some kind of violent spark that's going to be struck uh, somewhere in, in the not too distant future. If Tyson did not get an awakening from this experience, then he's finished. You know, no matter what happened to him, if he didn't learn from this experience, he should, he might as well quit boxing. Perhaps this is a wake-up call for him to take more responsibility in his own career 
and give some direction to it because Mike is highly intelligent and highly capable of giving those directions and giving instructions. I'm going to survive regardless of whatever my situation I deal with. I'm always going to survive. Only reason, reason I can't survive is if I'm dead or something, I'm going to survive. In a November interview for ABC's Primetime Live, Tyson said, quote, I forgot he, meaning Evander Holyfield, was a human being, end quote. On October 29th, Tyson suffered a broken rib and a punctured lung after falling off his motorcycle on a highway ramp outside of Hartford, Connecticut. Still to come on the best of Sports Center, a silver charmed way of life for a three year old. But up next, we slip into the bent world of Nick Bakai for his take on the year in sports. From time to time this past year, a guy named Nick Bakai has taken up your TV screen and likely had you believing you'd rolled over on your remote and lost contact with ESPN. It's okay. He's one of us. Sanctioned by top management to give sports and sports reporting a noogie, here's Nick Bakai, user-friendly. Well, it's time for the second annual Enbies, My Initials, My Awards. For the moments in 1997 that changed the way a Nick Bakai looked at the games we love so very well. So come on, let's pass out the honors. Well, the entire sports world takes this opportunity to go get a beer. The envy for most annoying gesture. Tell the wave to move on over, because here comes raising the roof. Come on, kids. Whatever happened to a good old pat on the popo? If this hotel's a rockin', don't come knockin', and the envy is a tie. Marv Albert and Frank Gifford will have to fight this one out in a luxury suite with the Do Not Disturb sign out front. Here's a tip. If you hear show tunes, that means Marv won. Yush! Is it really a sport? This year, it's a tie between harness racing and billiards. Here to accept the NB on their behalf is skeet shooting. Woo! Year after year, the woo NB goes to motorsports. Now, here's a fellow who deserves two NBs. One for the best use of Hercules wristbands, and the other for sheer pizzazz. Elvis Joyko. Wow. From now on, courtside photographers will stand like this. And the winner is Dennis Rodman. The Let's Break Down Some Film and Get Our Prostates Checked NB goes to Dick Vermeil and his Grey Panther coaching staff. The It's Hard to Read a Playbook When Your Mouth Is Full and You Can't Sound Out All Them Big Words NB. Who else? Billy Joe Hobart. What does this tell you about Ditka's offense? Clearly, even a lamp could run it. The Sarge, can I have a hug, Envy, goes to Riddick Bow. Does CCM make an adult diaper? And the Envy goes to Gordy Howe. Who gets the 1997 Envy for winning at any cost? The Buffalo Sabres, who acquired Satan in a trade for Barry Moore and Craig Miller, whose souls cleared waivers and were designated for assignment in Hades. Sorry, fellas. Half Psychosis will travel, and the Envy goes to Lawrence Phillips. Just goes to show you there's always work for a criminal with 4-4 speed. Is this festival seating? And the NB goes to Drew Bledsoe. But he called olive oil a floozy. Popeye Jones is fined 10 G's for a flagrant foul. Gets an NB. Why didn't they just call Andre Risen's girlfriend? The NB goes to the Omni in Atlanta for being imploded. Maybe he thought he might have to sit on the plane next to a guest from the Jerry Springer show. Barry Switzer takes a gun onto a plane, bags him an NB. I've seen bigger crowds at the sight of an overturned armored car. And the NB goes to the Tennessee Oilers. I just want to make sure you got your 50 bucks worth. And the winner is the second bite. How often does TV deliver something that incredible once, let alone gives you time to calm down, discuss amongst yourselves, and then watch it happen again? And finally, wait. I need the score of the Cutstown game, and I need it now. And the NB still goes to ESPN News. Here's to you, and here's to all the winners. And if you weren't mentioned, then you know what to do. Get on out there and do something strange, so I can mention you in 98. Until next time, I'm Nick Bakai. Nick Bakai performing again. Peak performers for 1997, in plural here. You, the computer using Internet Connected, have narrowed it to a single name. We'll praise the runners-up and big deal the winner right after this.
The suspense is over. Here's the choice you made as the top Sports Center commercial for 1997. Everyone makes a big deal out of the Sports Center catchphrases, but honestly, we make this stuff up right on the spot. Uh, welcome aboard flight 149 to right field. This is a non chewing flight. It's never iffy if it's griffy. That blows. It must be a homer, Simpson, because the pitcher just went dull. And because the catchphrases are so organic, it keeps the show fresh. Four! I am the most popular player in all of the land. Yahtzee! There was no such voting criteria in the search for our 1997 peak performer. We considered all offers, but since this was a democratic process, majority rules. Here are the results of the Sports Zone polls. We received 27,000 responses over a seven day period. Junior and Tiger battled for the runner up spot. They were followed by Vander Holyfield, Martina Hingis, and Michael Jordan. So now that I've set the table, Kenny gets to serve up the entree as our peak performer of the year. It's Barry Sanders who not only is a peak performer, but one who performs with grace. This past Sunday, after he ran his record of consecutive 100-yard rushing games to 14 and became the third player ever to go past 2,000 yards in a season, he was interviewed on the field after the game. It appeared Sanders was cut off in mid-sentence, but appropriately enough, his last words were, my teammates. He's not easy to dance to. Few partners match up well. He makes those who try to get close grasp air. You never know what Barry's going to do. He's an extremely scared runner. Anybody who's played against Barry Sanders uh, has looked stupid at one time or another. He makes you look silly. Barry Sanders cut back over the middle. Got free to the 25, 30. He's off to the races. 40 midfield. 40. It's a foot race to the 30. He slowed up but keeps going to the 10, 5, and touchdown! It may be that only history will get a firm grip on Sanders. This season, he raced past Marcus Allen, Franco Harris, Jim Brown, Tony Dorsett, and Eric Dickerson to move into second place on the all-time rushing list. Walter Payton's the only one left to beat. I'm amazed when I watch him because it seems like everybody wants to tackle him so hard and hit him so hard that they don't. Give to Barrett. Cut back over the middle of the 25 to the 20. Breaks a tackle to the 15. Stop, starts 10 5. Touchdown, Lions. Holy mackerel. Even for me, <laughs> and nothing makes me go, wow. <laughs> I mean, it even makes me go, wow. Down the right sideline, high step of the bit to the 20, to the 15, to the 10, to the 5, touchdown. See you later. But Sanders continues to sidestep individual accolades the way he sidesteps opposing tacklers. The thing that allows me to keep my job is being competitive each game and not worried about um, statistics. His name may as well be a verb, as in to Sanders someone. <laughs> when he gets the ball, it's taps for defenses. The Peak Performer of the Year is brought to you by Frost Brewed Coors Light, who reminds you the three most important words are, Hey, beer man. All the joy of winning a Stanley Cup title was washed away one night in Detroit. The story of the Red Wings' great triumph and greater sadness is told next. Silver Charm had won the Kentucky Derby in Preakness and out of the Belmont, the third leg for the Triple Crown and deep stretch and Silver Charm in green and on the lead. The Grave Freehouse has given up, but touch gold coming from the outside to deny Silver Charm. No Triple Crown in 97, none since affirmed in 1978. Way to go, Chris. Their summer began with unbridled joy. The Red Wings filled a 42-year Stanley Cup drought with a four-game sweep of the Flyers. Their summer was interrupted with tragedy. Defenseman Vladimir Konstantinov battled for his life following a car accident. Summer is over, but those two separate June occurrences live on for the 1997 Red Wings. Bob Lee looks at the wounded defending champions. Three seconds left into the zone. The Detroit Red Wings on the Stanley Cup champions. 
Late broadcast reports tonight out of Michigan say that Vladimir Konstantinov, the Stanley Cup champion Detroit Red Wings, is in serious condition after a one-car accident in suburban Birmingham. Only one team in the history of the NHL has ever traded its number one goaltender after winning the Stanley Cup the Detroit Red Wings. The Red Wings leading playoff scorer en route to Detroit Stanley Cup victory last season reportedly wants out. It was Detroit's first Stanley Cup in 42 years. What began as a summer of celebration became instead an off-season of tragedy, bitterness and frustration. The low point came less than a week after hoisting the cup. June 13th, defenseman Vladimir Konstantinov and Vyacheslav Fetisov, along with a team masseur, were injured when their limousine crashed into a tree. Fetisov was the least seriously injured. He was released with chest injuries within five days. Konstantinov, though, remained in a coma for more than two weeks. Well, the absence of number 16 creates a huge void for the Red Wings defense. Konstantinov, the Vladinator, was a finalist last year for the Norris Trophy, given to the NHL's top defenseman. We have to figure out a way to replace Vladdy on defense, because obviously he's a... You know, I think when teams play against Detroit and they talk about our team, I, I, my guess is that he's the one guy that they always talked about, you know, that, that the other team always thought about because you had to have your head up when he was on the ice. The most valuable player, the winner of the Conn Smythe Trophy, Mike Vernon. We knew sooner or later, I mean, both of us being here for a while, that something was going to happen and things changed. They did. Within two months, Mike Vernon, at the age of 34, was traded, along with his Conn Smythe Trophy, to San Jose. Despite his playoff heroics, Vernon expected the move. He had spent the regular season backing up Chris Osgood, and he'll be an unrestricted free agent after this season, leaving the Red Wings the choice, spend millions to keep him, or get nothing for him should he sign elsewhere. Time for me to be on my own. I've been here for my fifth year. I mean, I think I've been brought along very well the last uh, four seasons, looking back on it now. I mean, it's frustrating sometimes not playing, but at the same time, it maybe was the best thing for me. You know, you can't replace a Hall of Fame goaltender. You just can't, and I learned a lot from him. But I think the, the, the political side and the uh, financial side, you know, you can't have two number one goalies here. But the Wings begin this season without Sergei Fedorov. He's still holding out. After a 30-goal season, Fedorov wants a raise from last year's $4.2 million salary. But Fedorov's funk involves more than rubles. He wants to return to his role as a single-minded offensive player rather than a defensive forward, his role last year. So this season begins with the Wings preparing to raise their banner, defend their cup, yet still deal with the problems from a championship summer gone sour. Vladimir Konstantinov was transferred to a Florida Rehabilitation Center on November 9th. Team Masur Sergei Manatsikhanov was released from a Detroit hospital to continue his rehabilitation on December 10th. The limo driver, Richard Ganida, pleaded guilty to driving with a suspended license and was sentenced to nine months in jail. As for Sergei Fedorov, as Bob Lee pointed out, he continues his holdout and has actually upped his asking price. Still to come on the Best of Sports Center, the images that left a lasting impression in the year 1997. Best of Sports Center, presented by Frost Brewed Coors Light, who reminds you the three most important words are, Hey, beer man. Somewhere out there, a prize-winning Labrador is staring at the set thinking, I got dogged again. Apologies then to the exceptional performers who weren't included. Before we put another year to bed, we thought we would leave you with some of the more lasting images from 1997. From all of us here at ESPN, those in front of the camera and those behind the scenes, we wish you a happy and safe New Year.
just like a Friday afternoon Yeah, you can go there if you want Though it fades too soon So go on, let it be If there's a feeling coming over me Seems like it's always understood This time of year Well, I know there's a reason to change Well, I know there's a time for us you Think about the good times And you live with all the bad And you can feel it in the air Feeling right this time of year coach in the history of college basketball. The 1,000th career win for Scotty Bowman. Well, there's a football in the air Across the leaf-blown field Yeah, and there's your first car on the road And the girl you steal There's a feeling that there's something else Seems like it's always understood There's a time of year Well, I know there's a reason It's time of year Yeah, and I know there's a time for us Think about the good times you live with all the bad Time of year. Number 56, my time away! It's got a chance, it is number 58. Kevin Brown has fired a no hitter in San Francisco. Scoreless game, 10th inning. Oh, one pick drive, deep left field, no hitter, home run. You got it all. Oh, he made a catch. Unbelievable. Well, there's a feeling in the air. Just like a Friday afternoon Yeah, you can go there if you want Though it fades too soon So go on, let it be If there's a feeling coming over me Seems like it's always Yeah, and I know there's a time for